what I'd love for you to help us is, okay, an example of that being used, right? And you can touch on how you operate, what wealth is, how money works, and really walk us through your timeline. I'm going to take notes uh, so that we can kind of recap and then look at some of the Q&A in between and go from there. Does that sound good? Right on, man. Well, I mean, first and foremost, th thanks for having me on here. I, th I think it's really interesting, like you bringing up the whole competition thing, right? And um, I I'm going to double down on it. And I, and I agree with you so much. And I, I agree with you, not in a sense of seeing things long term, but seeing things in the really, really long term. Uh, which is the eternal viewpoint, right? So I, it was funny because I was I was having a, I was washing dishes the other night, and I oftentimes find that God will speak to me when I when I work out or when I'm washing dishes, and and some of the most profound things that God has said to me, it was actually outside of Scripture, it was actually outside of my time, like reading Scripture, and um, so I'm washing dishes the other day, and you know Jesus convicts me, he he just puts this quote in my head. And it goes, uh, you cannot build your empire and contribute to my kingdom at the same time. It's impossible, right? Like you can't do it. So um, I, I share that because I, I think a lot of people listening to this right now or maybe watching this, they're probably accustomed to watching other YouTube channels that are very faith-based, that are Christian-oriented. And that's fine. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I, I do think there are a lot of folks out there that are more so interested in building their empire and not really contributing to his kingdom. So um, I, I appreciate being on here and then being given the platform to be able to do this. Um, so, I mean, a lot of great things you shared about money, right? And by the way, a lot of my entrepreneurial success and uh, a lot of the things that Sam and I have done, whether it's the portfolio companies own or, or the portfolio of real estate that we own or whatever it may be, uh, was very it was very much on the backs of of prayer of seeking the Lord and inquiring of the Lord. Um, I think that's one thing, by the way, that a lot of people really underestimate. And I want to focus on uh, for the end of First Samuel and the the beginning of Second Samuel. It's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture because you see what David does right before he becomes king. And there's actually a period where it says, uh, David thought to himself, right? So up until this point, like this is after he slays Goliath. This is after, you know, he becomes this great warrior and they're singing songs about, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his tens of thousands. Um, but then there, there's a period of time, man, where Saul is pursuing David to try and kill him. And uh, out of fear, David thinks a lot to himself. And so uh, eventually what ends up happening is David joins the Philistines, which is the enemy, right? Then he has like 600 men with him. They all end up in this cave because the Philistines are like, hey, you can't fight with us because we're afraid that you're going to turn on us during battle. So you need to get out. Even though you've been with us for a year, you need to go, right? So David uh, takes all of his men, 600 of them to a cave. And then the Amalekites end up destroying the hometown of all of David's men. So they, they kill their sons and their brothers and uncles. And then they take their wives and daughters as slaves and they burn down the whole town. And it actually says it got to a point where uh, the men were so upset with David. And they're like, hey, this is not the man of God that we know that we're actually going to stone him. Right. Mm -hmm. They're going to stone him. And they wept and told them that their legs gave out, according to Scripture. So uh, then what's really interesting, it's one of my favorite lines in all of Scripture. It says, then David finally seeks out to the Lord. Then David finally inquired of the Lord. And then it's, and then and then you see things go up again. Right. Mm -hmm. And then David, hey, should I pursue these people? And God's like, yes, pursue them. I will deliver them into your hands, even though their army size is like five times. Right. So it, what's really interesting is the very next chapter after it says David inquired the Lord. Finally, uh, David actually becomes king. Right. That's how actually Second Samuel begins. Right. It says David named king of the tribe of Judah. So the reason why I, I bring that up is because um, almost every single one of us, myself included, when it comes to the topic of money, we don't inquire of the Lord. We actually think to ourselves, right? We always think to ourselves. It's why we watch books. We read, you know, I'm sorry. We watch videos. We read books. We hire financial planners because we want to find the most tactical, logical, smart way for us to build and increase our bank account. 
Um, and, you know, I grew up in a way where my, my perspective on money was a very interesting one because I grew up a pastor's kid. We grew up really poor. Um, you know, Sam and I were immigrants to this country from South Korea. Our very first apartment, like you turn the light switch on and the cockroaches go to the outsides of the room. Right. I, I loved going to school because it meant I got a meal. Right. It meant I got fed. Um, so it was really interesting because my dad and my mom and every single pastor that I met, like they always said, oh, like money is the root of all evil. Don't love money. Like money is horrible. Money is bad. But then every Sunday morning without fail, they would ask for money. And if there was ever a big project in the church, like we needed a new parking lot or we ended up new, you know, we need a new roof, uh, you know, pastors would almost guilt trip people into giving money, right? So I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people here watching, um, 38 of us, right? We all go to church or we have some level of faith orientation. I mean, it's day three for crying out loud. If you don't have some level of faith orientation, then you're probably not here, right? Uh, and, and we would probably gone to church and almost guaranteed like they're asking for money, whether it's just, hey, like your typical tithes and offerings, right? Or, hey, we have this big project and we have all these things. And, and it's amazing is because uh, whenever we need something done, uh, we ask God for money, right? And and the reason being is because I, I think with us Christians, uh, we have such a worldview and not an eternal view that we have handicapped ourselves and we've handicapped the abilities of God to think that things can only happen through money. Uh, and as a, as, a, as a man that owns eight, nine figure companies in my portfolio and does really well for himself, I can assure you that that's not the case, right? I can, I, I can absolutely guarantee you that that is not the case. That is not the way God works. In fact, if you look at scripture and anytime you see God rewarding anybody, whether it's Joseph, whether it's Daniel, whether it's whatever, it, it usually isn't through money. It's actually through authority and through influence. Now, the money comes after that, uh -huh. Right. But if you look at people like Joseph, if you look at people like Daniel, if you look at people who dedicated obedient to the Lord, it was never money. It was always influence and authority and, and resources came as a, as a way because the opportunities were given to those individuals. Right. But if there's any way that I want to kick off, I guess, this this talk. Right. Uh, it's two things. Number one, my encouragement to all of you guys to not to not necessarily think to yourself but more so to inquire of the lord right but to think of jesus the author and perfecter of our faith and see the unconditional love and light that he is and fixate your eyes on him and hear the thoughts that come to your mind as you fixate on him, right that'd be encouragement number one and i don't know how many people here are entrepreneurs but that's one of the things that sam and i do is every monday morning we sit down and we look at the biggest projects that we have in our companies and we inquire of God, God, what do you want us to know? And what do you want us to do? Uh, which, by the way, that that is the Hebrew word for obedience, right? The Hebrew word for obedience is shama. So it means to hear and respond. That's what obedience literally means. It doesn't mean to read your Bible and do exactly what it says. Although I, you know, there's a lot of credibility in the word of God, right? Like that is the word right. of God, that the word made flesh. It's Christ who died for us on the cross. But if you look at the original language of what it means to obey, right, which Jesus uses when it comes to, hey, if you are my disciples, you will obey, you will follow, you will obey my teachings, you will obey the Holy Spirit, you will obey the word of God. It means to hear and respond. People today think it means to study, be super smart and know exactly what to do. That is not the case. That's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees did that. And ironically, the Pharisees idolized money they idolized money they loved taking the and they are and what's here's what's crazy about evil right and this is what i love about the concept of good and evil and god's viewpoint on it is we as christians desire for the knowledge of good and evil because then we don't need the holy spirit to guide us on a day-to-day -day basis because mm -hmm. the holy spirit is not safe we are safe knowledge is safe right us having the process and the mythology Money is safe. Following Jesus and having the Holy Spirit is not safe, right? But it, it requires full submission and absolutely zero fear. So uh, shaman means to hear and respond. So that's how I would encourage and challenge people to inquire of the Lord is to hear and respond, right? That's number one. Uh, and number two, uh, the, here's the, the truth that I've learned over, over a very, very long period of time. And unfortunately, through a lot of many hard lessons 
is that I care way more about money than God does. That's that's very much of the fact, right? I care way more about money than God does. Because I would imagine, uh, as it says in James, you know, and I'll use James because you use James, right? But it says in James 3 uh, that we are nothing but a vapor in the mist, right? Our life is like the, like the, when you spray a bottle, right? Like when you spray Febreze, <laughs> right. you spray, right? It's, it's very quick, right? And if you think about it, like what's the life expectancy? 80, 90 years, right? 80, 90 years in a span of eternity is not a long time. So, I mean, my encouragement for a lot of you guys that are watching is, you know, money is a thing that's only present and only good here on earth, right? But yet Jesus is, it's the second most thing that Jesus most talked about. The first thing that Jesus talked about most often was the kingdom of heaven. The second thing was money. So we'll dive into as we continue this conversation, what Jesus talked about and what he means and what he wants. Because I, I believe, by the way, that if we have the right spiritual perspective on money, it will it will happen for us, right? Like if you're a, a dad, if you're a God and you're this perfect loving father, if you have a kid that's more fixated on you and trusts you and has a very healthy viewpoint on money, according to what he believes the father is a healthy viewpoint and is a very good steward of that money, wouldn't you want as a good father to give more of that to that child? Absolutely, right? So uh, the second thing is that because we have these eternal view on money, my encouragement is, hey, let's start thinking of a way where how can we care about the things that God cares about? Because if if all we care about is money, then I don't know if God is necessarily going to honor us and, and allow us to have opportunities to get more of it if we're not able to steward it well, if we don't have a good viewpoint. So to begin the conversation, those are my two encouragement. Listen and respond, inquire of the Lord. And secondly, Let's begin my understanding that we care way more about money than God does. Got it. Okay, so I want to, you basically just gave us a framework how you've operated for however many previous years leading up to this point, but it's been a journey of, of pivot and tweaks and, and adjustments, right? So first things first is seeking and inquiring the king. We definitely established this in day one and two. So it being reiterated again is super important. And you drew a distinction adding to this where it's like, you've got to decide either you're going to build your own kingdom and do your thing, or you're going to build under God's kingdom with the authority and influence that he gives you. Right. So it's not to say that this is a bad thing to have a economic environment that you have authority and control over, a.k.a. your household, a.k.a. your family, your your uh, business, people you steward over. Or this could be a church. The problem becomes when you mentioned trying to build this and then contribute some over here rather than just putting the whole thing under God's domain. God's kingdom is is where you're getting at, and you came to that conclusion at a very early age, just like yeah. And, 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 and you know what the best part is, is? Is Jesus gives us the blueprint on for us to see whether or not or where that where that decision is going, right? Because there's there's a lot of people who use their money, especially Christian, to exalt themselves and elevate themselves, right? Either um, willingly. Or sometimes in, in many cases, they don't even know that for sure they're doing it. Yeah. I, I know I've, I've had my moments where I'm like, oh, I just need to get, I needed a correction because I just saw myself like it's a very fine line. People think that it's black and white, but this could be a very gray area sometimes. I think for those who experience success, especially when you come from so little as myself and in your case, and I'm sure you've experienced moments where you've almost felt like you were kind of falling off that line and God has so much grace for us and, and mercy and patience and he allows us to, to come back, gives us the opportunity to simply repent, right? And course correct. And in the business world, we call that a pivot, right? We call that a, a change in, in strategy. We call that an update in the manual of how we're going to serve clients, right? As simple as that. So go ahead. Yeah, but, no, but and absolutely, right? So every, everything you said, you know, five stars, right? But, <laughs> but here's, here's what I, I want people to understand is, is uh, God doesn't want our money because he needs it, right? Like he can do anything he wants. He's God, right? Like he's, he could make anything happen. He could, he could install a new roof on your church 
that your church has been raising your money for two years for, right? Like he could just magically in a second put new shingles on that roof. He can do it. So, so the question is, well, why does he want our money if he doesn't need it? Well, it must mean because it has something to do with us, right? It must mean he has, it has something to do with me, right? So uh, I, I get annoyed and I'll, I'll, t I'll tie this full circle in a second. But for me, I, I get annoyed when uh, rich Christians will say that their, their, you know, their money is a blessing from God, right? I, I get annoyed, especially if I know their heart and I know where they're at, right? I, I get annoyed because here's the thing. If I'm, if I'm the enemy, if I'm Satan, I want you making $250,000 a year. I want you having a big house. I want you having a super nice car because chances are you probably are in a position where you feel like you don't need God, right? So if my job is Satan, like, like I hope everyone knows, Satan's job isn't for you to be poor. That's not his job. God's job is not to help you be rich. That's not his job. Like we human beings, we Christians, man, we think so small sometimes. Like we think about just our life here on earth, right? But if, if you're Satan, like here's what I want. If I'm Satan, if I'm the enemy, I want you to believe in as many lies as you possibly can. Because in Satan, Luce, if you look at Satan, it's the, it's the father of lies. If you, if you read what his intent, what his translation of his name means, it means the deceiver, right? It means the father of lies. So... For, for me, if I'm the enemy, I want you believing in as many lies as you possibly can that separate you from the love of Jesus Christ, right? And his redemptive work. That's what I want. And sometimes that lie is, hey, if I make $250,000 a year, it means I'm successful and, you know, I'll give credit to God, but I don't actually need him, mm. right? Like, so, yeah. like a lot of Christians have placed way more security uh, and, and, and their firmness on, on money more so than anything else, so much so that it's like when we make a lot of money and we stop inquiring of the Lord and we think to ourselves, we will actually give credit to God as a way for him not to. So I'll give you a perfect example. So um, I and I, I might get kicked out for this one. I, I, and I by the way, I have I have I've led Bible studies in my church and I've said this and I've been asked to not lead Bible. Studies, right. So so just warning you, I've warned you. Right. Um <laughs> But me personally, uh, I I do not believe in tithing, right? I'll wait for all the hate comments to come in, right? But um, <laughs> I, I I personally don't believe in tithing, and here's and here's why, right? There you go, three people left already. So I, I personally don't believe in tithing because uh, there was a time where I tithed very faithfully, very faithfully, right? Like ten percent. I had an, an additional five percent for. Thanksgiving offering, right? Like I was that dude, man, that I was, I would tie the very, very, very well to the church. And uh, one day the Lord convicted me and, and I mean, spoke to me as clear as day, as clear as Jesus showed up to, to, to Paul on his way to Damascus. You know, Jesus, I had, I had an encounter with him and he says, you know, Daniel, I think you love giving me 10% of your income because it just means you could control and have the other 90. And that stuck a knife through my heart because I had neglected the fact and the truth that during my time here on earth, everything I have is his, right? It's all God, right? It's all right. Like Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar is give to God's what is God's what is God's my heart, my soul, my mind, my body, my strength, my money, my marriage, my like my family, my house, my everything, right? So so today, the way I walk in today is I, I live in a place of freedom, where I go, okay, God, everything that I have is yours. What do you want me to do with it today? Right? What? How do you want me to allocate your resources? today you want to talk about being like imagine being called a good steward and you only you only are obedient with 10 percent of the resources that is the master right like imagine if you were a hedge fund manager and you have a client that where it's the client's money it's not your money it's the client's money like you're a money manager and you you're only doing 10 percent like you only allocate 10 percent of his money right and then the other 90 percent you're like doing whatever you want with it. It's basically, You're going to get fired. Right. So it's in, in other words, it's like you get a million dollars from a client. A client says, go invest this million dollars. You stick 900 in a, in a small, in a, in a savings account that earns less than 1%. 
and you just take a hundred grand and you go invest that in the market in a business and earn 10, 15 percent, whatever the case may be. You earn 10 percent on 10 percent of the client's money. That is a terrible rate of return. It's a horrible ROI. Right. It's, 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 it's a horrible ROI, right? So uh, the, the, the point that I want to drive, and, and by the way, like when, when I live under that, it ends up being more than 10 percent in terms Correct. of what I end up giving. Yes. Right. I can I can assure you of that. Right. It mm -hmm. ends up being way so, more than 10%. So to to give uh, you understanding for the person that just said, right, because even I have wrestled with this before where I talk to pastors that are afraid to say what you're going to say, because then basically tithes go down in the church when you say that when you free people from that obligation of being forced to tithe if you don't x y and z will happen so just to be clear it's not that you, you're saying i don't believe in tithing in the context of how it is being used and taught in the church that does not mean you're not giving money right like that doesn't mean that you're um making a uh like a loophole everything that i do in my companies is dedicated toward what God has for me to do. So therefore, it isn't my money to begin with, even though my name may be on the LLC or the company or these bank accounts. It is being fully driven and guided by God's influence over my life. Holy Spirit is working directly hand in hand with me on these day to day transactions. That's what yeah, because okay, because the understanding is that it's God's money and it's not mine. And 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 God God has a very like it's hard for us to think where God doesn't care, right? But I can assure you, God cares very little about money, very little. He cares more about money in a sense where what our viewpoint is on money, right? Like he, Jesus talks about it the second most, right? The second most thing he talked about because of, it dominates our mind, right? Like that's the whole reason why, like if it didn't dominate our mind, if humans had a, the, the righteous view on money, Jesus would have never talked about it, right? But but he talks about it because it dominates our mind. And by, and by the way, for pastors that are like, oh, I'm afraid to say it because I'm afraid tithing goes down. Well, it's like, in that case, what master do you serve? Correct. Because I don't know about you, but I believe in a God that is capable of anything. I believe in a God that takes care of us even when we don't have money. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I think there's a reason why Christianity is thriving in places where there is no money, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we're in some, in some of the most poorest countries, like that's where Christianity tends to thrive the most is because for them, they have nothing but to be able to rely on. Right. So, and, and by the way, if you look at the original translation of Hebrew word for righteous, it just means to, to have your actions and your words be aligned. Yeah. Right. That's, that's uh, right. All that means. Yeah. I, right? I, I've so said like right positioning. Is that, is that sound? For sure. Yeah. I mean, like that's, that's the original translation of the word righteous in Hebrew in, in the original text of scripture. It's just, it, it means for your words and your mind and your actions to all be in alignment. That's all that means. So if you have a serial killer who thinks like a serial killer, acts like a serial killer, talks like that person is righteous because their, their words, their mind and their actions are all aligned. Now, is it good? No, <laughs> right? Obviously, like we don't want people running around like, oh my gosh, I'm a serial killer, right? But like, let's, if, if we're gonna say that God truly owns cattle on a thousand hill, if we're truly going to say that God loves us and takes care of us, if we're truly going to say that everything that we have is his, well, let's, let's, let's start acting like it, right? Yeah. Let's actually start inquiring of God to actually ask him how he wants it to be done, not us trying to figure it out on our own. So to get into the more of the meat and potatoes of it, like that's, that's how I handle my real estate investing career today, right? Which by the way, I, I started investing in real estate when I was 18 because I, I read a Forbes article that said that out of the top 1% of people in the world, like something like 84% of those people made their wealth by investing in real estate, right? So I was one of those guys that I did a lot of research on like stocks, bonds, crypto, day trading. Like I, I did a lot of research before deciding at eight, 18, like, hey, what do I want to dedicate the next five years to or the next seven years to in terms of my career? And I, and I loved real estate because I got to control the income that was coming from my investment. Uh, with stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you can't do that. You cannot control the income that you generate from those vehicles of investment. You can't do it. Real estate's the only one. Because I can go and buy an apartment building, right? I can buy a 20 unit apartment building, 
and I could raise the rent. I can add in vending machines. I can add in storage units. I can add in washers and dryers. I can add in a lot of different things that increase the income on that asset. Right. So for me, I was like, okay, like I, I want to invest in something where my creativity is going to shine, but also give me the tax benefits that it gives me every single year, it gives me the appreciation that it gives me every single year, the equity that gives me every single year. You know, those are things that I want to invest in. So I chose real estate. But when I when I think about my deals today, like even before I go after a deal, I inquire of God. I say, God, just like David asked you, and just like David prayed, hey, should I go after this enemy? Will you give me into their hands? I ask God, hey, do you want me to do this deal? Mm -hmm. Let me right? ask you. Do you this. want me to do this deal? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Let me, let me ask this. Um, you started your journey at 18 years old. Now you, you did mention growing up in the faith um did your framework start at 18 or did it kind of build along the way so oh gosh no 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 no, no. so so at 18 so I, it was kind of like your own thinking okay i just read this forbes article i just got exposed to knowledge that turned into a way of thinking a concept idea philosophy boom you went for it right yeah. at what point did it start to shift and why? Yeah, so here, here's like my whole journey, right? So, okay. so I, when I was 18, 19, I, I thought the way that every other Christian thinks, which is I want to build a giant business, I want to tithe, allocate, and I want to do it for God. I want to give the credit to God. That's mm -hmm. that's Good how intentions. all Christians, a <laughs> lot of Christians think, right? It's yep. like, hey, we're going to build this giant business, we're going to donate a bunch of money, yep. but at the end of the day, secretly, it's because I want to be rich, right? Yep. So I, I wanted to do things for God. And then I got into college and then the, the spirit transformed my heart and my head. And it changed from, I want to do things for God and I want to do things because of God. And it was because I want to, I want what me is. building my business and all these things to be a response to his grace and his love. At what right? age did that happen? So I was like 21, 21, okay. 22. Right. So, uh, it, it went from me wanting to do things for God. And then when I started making a little bit of money, uh, I wanted to do things because of God, because I want to do things as a response to his grace, to his love, to his mercy, all these things. And I, th and I think that's a great perspective to have. Uh, but then when I was 24, when I was 24, 25, it was actually around the time I got married, I was at a Wednesday night group. And uh, we weren't even talking about this. We were talking about something else. I think we were, I think we were actually talking about trafficking, right? And then in the middle, in the middle of the group, the Holy Spirit convicted me and says, uh, Daniel, I love that you do all these things. I love that you donate money. I love that you built this business. I love that you're, you know, you're a great leader. I love that you do all these things. Sometimes I wish we could just do it together. And my, my framework, because when I heard that, right, when I heard the Lord tell me, it's like, Daniel, I love that you donate money. I love that you do all these things. I just wish we could do it together, right? Um, that for me was a wake up call because I saw a loving father who has given me everything that I have, who wanted to spend time with me. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, so before that perspective you go, change. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So yeah. sorry. Uh, from 21 and onward, it switched from doing things for God to now because of God. Still, there isn't that partnership with God because he then convicts you at age 24. So from 18 to 24, was it just real estate investing, building real estate business? Or yeah, it was, so, it was, so it was real estate. And then we, Sam and I had a marketing company on the side that did really okay. well as well. So, gotcha. so that, was the, that was the mantra, right? But it's funny because the, the, the greatest leaps and bounds, and this is, this is the thing that everybody wants to hear, right? But the greatest leaps and bounds that our business has made uh, was when we were doing things with him not for him and not because of him, because when you're doing things for God and because of God, it's on your strength. It's actually yeah. about you, <laughs> right? But when you're doing things with God, it's actually about the, it's about the unity. It's about the intimacy that you receive. And by the way, doing things with God is not easy. It's no. like following Jesus. It's not easy. Sometimes Jesus will intentionally lead you to your greatest and biggest fears. That's why there are so many, there are hundreds of people, like people talk about the 12 disciples, right? There were thousands of people that followed Jesus, thousands. Yeah. At one point, there were hundreds of disciples, but right. then everybody left, right? To the point where Jesus is like, he looks at the 12. It says in scripture, he looks at the 12 and he goes, you're not going to leave too, are you? Because at that point, hundreds of people had left. They heard what he had to say. And they're like, this is too hard. We're out, mm -hmm. right? And Jesus actually on two separate occasions, he goes, who can accept this teaching? 
right? He says that. He goes, who can accept this hard teaching, right? And he goes, you're not going to go too, are you? And then Peter responds, hey, like we have nowhere else to go. You have the words of eternal life, right? So I'm just giving you a lot of people warning, right? Because it sounds cool doing things with God, not for God or because of God. But I'm telling you, if you do things with God, he will lead you to the deepest and darkest parts of your fears, right? The deepest and any, any insecurity, like, so for me, the deepest and darkest fears I had where I wasn't good enough, I'm not worthy. And people think I'm a loser and I'm a failure, mm-hmm. right? And there have been plenty of times where out of obedience to the Lord, uh, that fear became a significant reality, right? But what does God say over and over again in scripture? Fear not, do not be afraid, mm-hmm. right? Do not be afraid. And oftentimes a lot of people, and I'll, I'll just be very straight. And I say this because I'm not on this broadcast to exalt myself. I'm here to exalt the name of Jesus, right? Because even Jesus says himself in Matthew, if those who are exalting themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted, right? Mm-hmm. So I say this not out of a place where I want to shake it up and exalt myself, right? But so many of us are here. A lot of you guys are here. So 50 of us now. A lot of you guys yeah, are they here. Came back. They, came, they, they came, came back. They came back. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. We, 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 a yeah. lot of you guys are here to learn how to make money because you're really afraid. Because mm-hmm. you're afraid. And it's okay. I'm afraid. Yes. And by I'm the way, afraid. what God, right? And what God wants isn't for us to overcome our fear, by the way. What God wants is for us to be honest with our fear, right? Because we see this in Peter, right? So one of my favorite scriptures in one of the passages in scripture is when when Jesus re- reinstates Peter. They're having breakfast, right? The, the fishermen are fishing and, you know, they see Jesus and it's the Lord and Peter jumps out of the boat and they're, you know, Jesus is barbecuing fish, right? Like as they actually, he says, hey, bring some of the fish you caught, right? So he's got a bonfire going and Jesus goes, Peter, do you truly love me more than these? And Peter goes, of course I love you, right? But I love that scripture because all the way up in that point, Peter was this guy who puffed up his chest and was like, oh, Jesus, I love you. I will die for you. I will go to the ends for you. I will do all these things. Like, like right. Peter's all talk, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Up until this point, Peter's all talk. And Jesus finally puts him to, hey, the reality is before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. That's the reality. And Peter's like, I would never do that, right? And then he does. And then for, and while Jesus is dead, Peter's like it, living in this super shame mode. Like his fears have been proven true. And his fear is that he is a fraud, right? And so he, his fear has come to reality. And, and then finally, when Peter goes, uh, hey, Jesus, like, because Jesus is like, hey, do you love me? Like, and, and you know, Jesus says agape love. He asks Peter, Hey, do you love me? Agape love. And agape, by the way, is Greek for the highest form of love, right? It's like, hey, Peter, do you truly? And then uh, uh, but, and I don't, I hate that the Bible doesn't mention this, right? But Peter responds and Jesus, of course, I love you. Phileo love. Phileo is brotherly love. It's actually like two steps below agape, right? Because Greeks have different levels of words for love. Like in American, in, in, in English, it's love is love, right? But in Greek, it's, it's you have agape, then you have uh, uh, phileo, and you have like all these other different forms of love. So Peter goes, Jesus, you know, I love you, but he responds in a different, in a lower level of love, right? A lower level. And so Jesus goes, thank you for actually being honest. Thank you for being truthful about what you actually feel and who you actually are. And because of your truthfulness, you are the rock in which I will build my church. So when Peter responds in, when he truth tells, when he confesses, about his fears to Jesus, Jesus then elevates him because he is now humble, Uh right? He elevates him and gives him position and authority and influence by being the rock of the biggest organization the world has seen, which is the Christian church, which is the movement that Jesus came to start. He names Peter as the captain of that team because of his truthfulness. So there's power and we're all afraid, right? We established that we are afraid, right? So what would it look like? How much power is there in being truthful to the Lord on what we're actually afraid of? Like, that's the point I'm trying to drive home, right? So when I got married, I said, right, God, I am afraid. I am afraid because I'm afraid of being the type of husband that I saw a lot of other people being which is not listening, exercising my authority, being abusive, right? All these things. I am afraid 
what do you want? And going back to the obedience, right? Listening and responding. What do you want me to know? And what do you want me to do when it comes to being a great husband? And what the Lord told me was give away to your wife what I give to you, which is unconditional, unshakable love every single day. You receive it first, then you give it to your wife. Because it is a fact that as human beings, we cannot give away what we ourselves do not have. Right. And we naturally give away what we have. So if we are fear-driven people, we will give away fear. That is just the way that we humans operate. So for, for me as a husband, it's like, hey, like, help me receive your love, Lord. And now that's the next question. Help me receive your love. What do you want me to know about my inability to receive love from you, God? And please help me disperse it away. Give it away to my wife. Give it away to the people out of the overflow that is me. Right. So that's the way. And we and by the way, we can think of that way with money, right? We can all go right now after this live stream is over. We can ask, hey God, what do you want me to know? What are the lies that I believe about money? What are the lies that I believe about myself and money? And what do you want me to know? And what do you want me to do when it comes to money? And here's a great litmus test. And I'll end, I'll end my ramble here, right? But here's a great litmus test. And this is this is a litmus test of my my friend Jamie Winship which I think everybody here should go listen to his podcast, read, a, read his books. A lot of what I'm talking about actually originated from Jamie's writings. But one of the things that Jamie convicted me of is here's a litmus test uh, to see if you're wanting to build your own empire or contribute to the kingdom. Uh, if, if God asked you to write a check for the opposite political party you believe in, would you actually do it? Would you actually do it? Right? So, so for me, like I'm a conservative Republican. If God asked me to write a 15 or a $50,000 check to the Biden administration, right? Would I do it? Because if I don't, it actually means I contribute and I care more about my own agenda than I do uh, the actual kingdom of God and actually obeying the Holy Spirit, yeah. right? And, and by the way, that's, what, that's where most Christians live. Most Christians live in a place where they care more about their agenda on earth than actually what God tells them to do. Right. And, and money, money is a true reflectant of that. And until we can sort that mess out, it does not matter what we learn real estate wise. It doesn't matter what we learn stocks or velocity, whatever. It, it does not matter. You are adding more and more garbage uh, to or you're adding more and more weight on a foundation that is not straight. That, that, that is a fact. Yes, that. And I would also add, you know, there's this very controversial book called Revelations. And I just don't for me personally, I don't want to be in a position of time where I made it more difficult for God's agenda over my life because I leaned in a certain way politically, financially, health-wise, whatever it may be, or the type of people I choose to hang around with, right? Because I'm like, no, I like these kinds of people more. These are my people, right? Type, type thing. And that's where we get into those cultural wars and things that happen both politically and just in your household, right? So I just would not rather be in that particular position. So coming back to age 24, so recap here, uh, 18 years old, we began our journey and the intent was how can I invest in real estate and make all this money and be successful for God? Then it was by 21, you were like, got convicted and then God's like, how, how can we do things more together and then you started doing things because of god then another conviction comes age 24 by now would you say like financially you're good you're solid better than most right in the top say 10 percent of american income earners right at this point 24 years old doing awesome get married so we we you get married at 24 and you were getting convicted on how to love your wife yeah and so it's it's 18 for God, 21 because of God. And at 24, that's when the Lord convicted me to do things with God. With God. Right? So, yeah. So, so when you do things with God, things just are better, right? Like it's just, so, it's just like our, our, and I'll, I can't emphasize this enough. Like our business has like, since I've done things with God, like we've had the fastest rate of growth since then, mm -hmm. like 300% year over year growth because of the things that we do with God. Now, have there been times where I was, uh, God was asking me to be obedient to things that actually hurt the business, but helped his kingdom thousand yeah. percent, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's not about you. It's 
about it's about God. What is His will? What is His agenda for His family? Right, yeah. that we are a part of. How does how does Revelation, when you read through that, help you understand the times that we're in? Because as far as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, Book of Revelation is broken up into three parts. It's the things that were, that things that happened, the things that are, and then the things that will come to pass. Right. So future, and then as I understand it. We're in the last of the last days, so we're in the the things that still are, as were recorded by, what was it, John, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so knowing, having a good interpretation, or I should say the right interpretation of Revelation to truly understand the times we are in today in 2024 being the last of the last days, if you come to that conclusion, and to know that, okay, there's going to be these 10 kingdoms that rise, you know, this one kills three, and it's like, you know, you got these fourth, you know, horse, we got all these different things that are occurring, so we know that none of those have occurred just yet. We're still living in a time of a fracturing of multiple ideologies, multiple powers that have yet to uh, unify. So we haven't seen that uni unification yet, and then the 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 kings the 10 kings that will rise out of that particular situation and then you'll have the one the 11th that comes in and starts doing all these things so before i i go crazy there but how does knowing that book help you know that when god is telling you to do something that is an adverse negative re reaction or negative effect to your successful business today or God's successful business, I should say, that you're stewarding over? How do, how do you draw that distinction to know that, okay, logically, this doesn't make sense. We ran the numbers. I ran it with my brother. And if we make this move and go to these people over here, we're going to lose money. How do you draw that distinction to know that you're not just, you know, you had too many, you know, cups of wine last night or, you know, <laughs> uh, influenced by the wrong dude. This is truly coming from God. It, do, you, yeah. do you lean on the word to validate what just came into your mind or is it more of a you react and you just you you move forward with it help help me understand that part because there are some times in my life where that was the decision i had to do to almost target a certain group of people that would not make me money to avoid these higher tier clients and i chose to stay with these clients my income went down but i got even closer with God in there. And now I'm starting to see income go up, right? It's like this, this, this flowing. And I think that's credited to me simply trying to do things my own way. And when I steer off for three months and then I get a conviction and I start coming back. So I think it's just, there, there's things to that, but if you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So there's three, I think there's three, if not four, uh, times throughout the gospels where people ask Jesus, why are you here? Right? Like they ask him, what's your purpose? Why are you here? Mm -hmm. And Jesus answers almost every single time he goes, I have come to do the will of the one who sent me. Right? So for me, when I think about like the book of revelations and just the day to day, what does that look like? Lean on the Lord to simply live in a way where I just simply do what God asked me to do every single day. I, I am here to do the one of the will who sent me. Right? So I, I know that if we're talking day-to-day -day stuff, like I know on an, on any given day, Jesus multiple times had to go into a quiet place to spend time with the father. Right? So if Jesus did that, I should probably do that. So that's, that's a, a, a tactic that I've picked up and a habit that I picked up that I would encourage everybody to do. Multi, I mean, just a, a couple times a day, even once a day, just spend five minutes and go in a bathroom or go in some quiet, or even just do it in your office and just spend time with God. And it doesn't have to be scripture. It could just be asking God, hey, God, what do you want me to know and what do you want me to do? So in this five minutes that I, I spend with you, what do you want me to know? What are lies I'm believing about myself that just aren't true? What are the truths that you do have for me? What do you want? What do you want me to know? I just want to spend time with you. I want to hear you. Right. Because I think a lot of times people interpret spending time with God reading the Bible. And when you read the Bible, it's very much of a one sided conversation. Right. Uh, yeah. So for me. Because when you read the Bible, it's what you interpret the words to be. So for me, I do my best. Like, God, you know my heart. You know where I'm at. Allow me to listen to your voice and hear your voice during this time. Like, I, I want to spend time with you to figure out where I need to go, what my guidance and direction needs to be. And because I, you know, 
I like I love the Bible. I read scripture every day. My wife and I read scripture every night, and I read scripture. You know, when I I actually listen to scripture when I when I work out when I'm in the car, right? So and it, like it says, like meditated on it day and night, right? Yeah. So I I love scripture, but I think a lot of Christians uh, they stop at the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is to point towards the works of Jesus and and the Holy Spirit. Like imagine staying at a Ritz Carlton. And, you know, like if, if you go to like really, really nice hotels, right? Like if you go to like a suite, they have they have like kind of like the shoe room, like the lobby, and then you have your suite, right? And I, I think a lot of Christians spend so much time in the lobby and in the shoe room that they forget, hey, hey like there's this whole suite for you. There's this whole yeah. executive suite at the Ritz-Carlton that's for you and you're missing out because you're just spending time in the shoe room, Right. And so when I see a lot of Christians, they just, all they do is just read their Bible and they never hear the Holy Spirit. They never hear the things that God wants them to do on a day-to-day basis. I'm like, oh my gosh, like you're missing out, right? Like you're, you're the one missing out. Like God will do what he wants to do, regardless of whether or not we say yes, right? What, regardless, regardless of whether or not we obey, God's will will be done. Sometimes we're, we as human beings, we're so narcissistic that we think just because we didn't obey God's word, that it's just not going to happen. And that's not true. Yeah. Uh, God, right. is, yeah. God will do things, whatever he wants, whenever he wants, regardless whether or not you're in your room reading your Bible or you're smoking crack, right? Like he will do what his will be done, regardless of what you decide to do. Mm-hmm. But the joy for us is that we get to participate him in that, right? Like my yeah. favorite line on evangelism like my favorite tactic on evangelism isn't to go door knocking that's the worst form of evangelism you actually turn more people off to jesus than you do for jesus my favorite thing for evangelism my favorite tactic for evangelism is to simply ask god god you love this person like way more so i'll give you an example so i i have a um a, a, a person on my leadership team who has worked with me for six years, six years, right? And he's a pretty high ranking executive in one of my company. And so for six years, I asked God, God, you love this person way more than I could possibly imagine. You are recklessly pursuing this person. What are you doing in that person's life? And is there anything I could do to help you? And what can I do to join you in that, in loving this person? Yeah. Right. And for six years, God was like, don't bring me up. Don't talk about it. Just love this person, care for this person, promote wow. peace, love for this person, love this person. That's it. Love this person. Love this person. Don't mention anything about scripture. Don't mention whatever you could talk about it. But only if you like only if you bring it up and he happens to be in the room, but you are not. And then finally, about a month ago, I, I was working out and and I was like, God, is there anything you want me to know? Is there anything you want me to do? He goes, yes uh go over the book of luke with this person with this high ranking executive because this person was interested in learning more about leadership right and so the spirit was like hey you know the greatest leader tell him the greatest leader that i know i believe ever walked the earth was jesus let's read this book called the book of luke together to figure out what type of leader jesus was Mm. right so the spirit convicts me is like i want you to call this person say exactly what I just told you to say and go over the book of Luke with this individual's two chapters every single week in your one-on-one conversation. So we've been going over the book of Luke every week, right? For the last like four or five weeks now, right? And my thing is, okay, God, like we're going to, I'm being obedient. It's it's a matter of your spirit transforming this person. It has nothing to do with what I say or nothing that I could sell. It's your transformative works. People draw closer to you. It's nothing. I don't bring people to Jesus. Jesus does that, right? So uh, it's really neat because after six years, it's like, wow, like, okay, like, God, what do you want to do with this person? How can, how can I be obedient, right? So if you want to evangelize people, uh, if you want to bring people to the Lord, I guess, which doesn't exist, Jesus brings people to Jesus. We don't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to be evangelistic, then think about the two or three or four people that you want to, I guess, evangelize and ask God, God, you love this person way more I can imagine. What are you doing in this person's life and how can I join you in that? That's awesome. Do that. And I, I, I'll tell you, I guarantee it, he'll ask you to do things that are really uncomfortable. <laughs> Definitely. Not only in our own business, in our own lives, but again, it's like, what is, could that be a financial freedom strategy? How do we 
love according to how he loved us first. All right, like what if we, what if there was a way to measure that? You know, me putting on my, my logical brain because that's the way God wired me to so just kind of look at the numbers and just look at the facts of things. And then like the emotion comes with it and I get driven by it. But so when, to, to kind of close us out here, because I'll be very respectful of your time. I know we're at the uh, 11 o'clock on the top of the hour here. So could that be a strategy in and of itself? And when you look at what you've given us today, this framework is building on what we just built on the last two days. The question that people are still going to ask, Christian or non-Christian, Daniel, how do I make more money? <laughs> Daniel, how do I, you know, what's the, what's the best way to make money right now in 2024? And it's like the last three days we've been giving the answer. It's been right, like there, right in front of us. And it's looking like a secret because we're telling stories. We're, we're uh, educating on experience. And the same answer that Travis gave, myself gave, and now Daniel gave three totally different people from totally different walks of life are saying, seek and inquire the Lord first and ask. Ask and it shall be given. Start there. Travis yesterday said something interesting that it's usually, not always the case, but he said it's usually the first thought when you honestly, truthfully seek him and inquire on the Lord of how you should go out into the marketplace and generate a, a stream of income and build a business and build a life according to his will. And you sit there and you allow the first thought, he writes it down, that's, what, that's his strategy. He writes it down. He's like, usually it's typically that first thought that comes to mind. You might write YouTube channel. You might write construction business. You might write health business, um, you know, supplements, whatever it may be. And then the second thought is from the accuser, Satan, to, to trash that idea, to tell you why that's not going to work because you're not a good speaker, because you're not a good salesperson, because you're not good on camera because you've never started a business before, because you've never made that kind of money before, because you don't have the startup capital, da, 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 da. And now you go seek out a guru to help you process all the reasons why this won't work instead of going it through him. So that's how I want to kind of close it here with you guys all that have spent the time. By, by, by the way, real, real quick, sorry. So you, if you guys want to know what my definition of financial freedom is, we can, we can all be financially free right now, like in this moment, right? And it's just by simply asking God, hey, what lies am I believing about money, right? Like my, my definition of financially free is not having a passive income where you don't have to work anymore, right? Like that's to me, that's not financially free because I know a lot of quote unquote financially free Christians that are so enslaved by what they believe about money. Correct. Right? Like my, my definition of financially free is are you truly reliant on God and not money? Like, are you truly free from not allowing money to do what God's asking you to do and for you to hinder your perspective on God? Absolutely. Right. And that's that's for me, it's like that's financial freedom. Right. Because because financial freedom from the world perspective will do really well for you during your time on Earth. But that definition is horrible. If you look at the eternal perspective. Mm -hmm. But Absolutely. if you look at financially free from a heaven, like an eternal perspective of like, hey, like I just want to be free Right. Like if God asked me to write a check to my enemy for fifteen thousand dollars, I want to be able to do it. If you can do that, you're financially free because it means you're you're prioritizing God's kingdom over your own resources and over your own desires and over your own safety and over your own fear. Right. So that's a litmus test. If you can right now in this moment, write a check, an uncomfortable number for your uh, uh, for your enemy. Like so if you're a big Trump supporter, if you could if God tells you to write a check for five thousand dollars to the Biden campaign and you can do it cheerfully because it's the joy comes from your obedience to the Lord, not the actual action. Congratulations. You are financially free. That's beautiful. I like that because it just takes away from all the traditional and alternative financial education that even I put out that again, it's not saying that those things are bad. It's when those become the thing rather than God first and have all those things, have the life insurance policy, have the influence in the political parties, have the, the influence in business and marketing and have the social media influence and authority and, and credibility and reputation, have it all. Those are not bad things. These are desires. God put it in our heart to have those desires to begin with. It's a matter when those become greater than him. And that's where we have those pivots and corrections. That, that's what this boot camp was all about. Before you go, I don't know if we have enough time just to address some of the 
of the folks yeah, here yeah, yeah, yeah. in the chat here. Got a bunch of, you know, people saying good morning to you. Appreciate everything that you're doing. Sandra subscribed to you, um, says that they are a blessing. So you and Sam, uh, more good mornings. Uh, here's an interesting one. So I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. Do I need to be here for financial counseling? Right. Great question. I, I work with a ton of non-believers. It's the weirdest thing. I don't know how God gave me that ability to just turn it off. A lot of Christians don't know how to turn off Christianese. Like, you know, <laughs> um, and so when I, when I work with, I'm going to use his name, bubble wrap, right? <laughs> uh, I don't start with that. I, I address the problem at hand. What, so financial counseling doesn't mean Christian theology. Like financial counseling is financial counseling. It's how are you wrapped up in these problems, these obstacles that you've, you've dealt with. But what anything you would add to that on just the idea of counseling or just anything there that would help? Yeah. I, I, well, I think to your point, man, it's like a lot of people will see the word atheist and they'll, it'll trigger a lot of Christians to want to convert that person. Yeah. You know, and... For me, it's like, hey, man, I've, I've got no desire to shove anything down your throat. You know, from, I'm just sharing for me what my journey has been and, you know, what my journey in following this guy named Jesus has, has been all about for me and, and how it's helped me. And it's actually helped me. It's freed me from a lot of things. Um, you know, I know plenty of Muslim people that follow Jesus. I know plenty of atheists that follow Jesus. I know plenty of agnostic people that follow Jesus. Right. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, it's not what the label says it is. You know, so uh, hopefully bubble wrap, you know, in, in me sharing, you know, what I've shared today, even if you want to remove all the God stuff from it, hopefully you've gotten a, a few great nuggets and a few takeaways on what you want to do with your finances. Absolutely. Awesome. Let's see. Good morning. Thank you for hosting this session. Appreciate all that you do to spread the good news of the kingdom. Pearl, good client of mine for years. Explain more. Don't follow Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I'm not tracking you. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure what, where that happened. Or she might be responding to someone else in the comments. Maybe that. Uh, Joey says he's been following both of you for years. Me and you. Appreciate all the help with finances. Living meaningful, significant lives that are pleasing to God. Lena says, I need to hear more. He's telling me my testimony. That's awesome. Where can we find Daniel? Uh, look up the Quack Brothers. They will pop up. They have a massive, awesome YouTube channel. Let's see. I agree. Tithing is not a command from God. You are right. Everything we own and have belong to God. God wants a cheerful giver. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 7 through 15. Yes, this is a problem with most pastors. Absolutely. Anna saying hi. Oh, Kathy says, I found you and Zell via the Quack Brothers originally. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's like Kathy's a client. Like we've done business together. It's pretty nice. awesome. Uh, <laughs> this is funny. Is this really live? Yes, we are live right here. <laughs> <laughs> My brother, you are blessing my soul. Thought I was only getting money advice, but gaining much more, which is priceless. And I think that is the block. That is a block in and of itself. People want money advice, but what you're what you're feeling inside, you know, you say one thing, but you're actually doing a different thing. Mo like most of my clients say they want to be debt free. They want to make more money. They want to cash flow more, but actually they want to break free from these money beliefs and so they keep doing things that are contradictory to this and until we release this let go of it now whether you use stones hug trees you know do a, a whole thing to make that happen I'm, i think you're going to be in a better position than the person that still has those problems but i would i would one up and say the person that made those stones and those trees may have something more to say on that that could be even more rewarding now and forevermore, right? Like there is, there's something to be said there. Just consider that. Pan Pan says, I started out listening to you and a couple of others, but I'm not one that wants preaching or religion involved in my personal finances or my other stuff. So therefore, I guess I wish you the best. Absolutely. I think I'm actually, again, I have a lot of clients. Like Pam Pam, I believe I have a client named, I know I have a client named Pam. Don't know if it's the same Pam, but they're like, Denzel, what are you doing, right? And I'm like, it's only a matter of time. I, I've been called to put this out. So it's, it's not because of me. If this hurts my reputation temporarily, then, then so be it. If, if I, if I uh, run away half of my clientele that are non-believers, then, then so be it, right? But I'm still here, right? Like they're still getting valuable you know, content. I know the way you talk too. Like there's content where you're like, 
you would never know this guy's uh, a Bible believing, you know, all in for Jesus guy. Like you wouldn't know. And that's not a bad thing either. Right. It's 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 how God is guiding you. Right. So I think that's important. Let's see. Do I have do you, do you need to jump? It is right at the hour. 15. Yeah, I, I, I do. So, I, you know, it's 15. Okay. So uh, but I mean, I just want to thank you for this time, man. And, you know, mm -hmm. blessings to every single one of you guys. And, um, you know, if there's anything I could do to help, please let me know. Yes, I put the link for you guys to reach out to Daniel and his team uh, for those that are looking to, you know, get into the real estate space or accelerated banking. Um, they are masters at that. They've been doing it longer than I have. And I've just been, you know, riding right behind learning and, and growing and partnering up. So this has been uh, an awesome experience having you here, Daniel. So I will let you go. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And you enjoy the rest of your day. God bless. You got it, my friend. I'll see you.